Welcome to the CanMed Coffee Talk podcast, where we talk with the leading minds in cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, and safety testing. I am your host, Ben Amaralt. I am the marketing manager at Medicinal Genomics and proud member of the team that puts on the CanMed conference. All right, just a few reminders before I introduce this episode's guest. If you are listening to this episode on the day it's released, then I'd like to remind you that the abstract submission deadline for KMED 24 is November 18th. So if you have any new or novel research related to cannabis science, medicine, cultivation, or safety testing, we want to hear from you. I put a link in the show description where you can learn more about the abstract submission process and submit your abstract. Good luck. Also, our early bird deadline for KMED 24 ticket packages is December 1st which is a little more than two weeks away. If you are planning to join us in Marco Island this May, then now is the best time to register. You will save $300 on our full summit package, which includes access to the medical practicum, industry workshops, oral presentations, poster presentations, networking events, meals, and a three night stay at the GW Marriott Marco Island Resort with all the associated amenities. So head over to canmedevents.com now to register, and I hope to see you in Florida this May. Our guest this episode is Dr. Laszlo Metchler. Dr. Metchler is the Chief Medical Officer at the Dent Neurologic Institute, the largest outpatient neuroscience center in the United States. Dr. Metchler is the director of the Dent Cannabis Clinic which has more than 15,000 patients certified through the NYS MMJ program and continues to grow each day. Dr. Metrula has published some of the first major retrospective research trials on medical marijuana and headaches and other neurologic disorders and lectures both nationally and internationally and is a recognized leader in the fields of neuroimaging, headache medicine, neuro-oncology, and medical cannabis. Dr. Metchler is also a member of the CanMed24 Advisory Board. During our conversation, we discuss how the Dent Institute is uniquely positioned to study medical cannabis for a variety of conditions, results from recent studies conducted at the Dent Cannabis Clinic, the challenges of studying medical cannabis and how a proposed rescheduling could help, and the ongoing struggle to convince fellow clinicians and medical associations that medical cannabis is legitimate. Before we get to my conversation with Dr. Metchler, I'd like to thank this episode's sponsor, the Dent Institute. With more than 300,000 patient visits per year, the Dent Neurologic Institute ranks amongst the largest neuroscience centers in North America. Its 24 subspecialty clinics often treat the most challenging neurologic conditions, including, but not limited to, migraine, chronic pain, ALS, MS, Parkinson's, dementia, and neuro-oncology. With their mission of advancing neuroscience, the Dent Institute established a cannabis clinic in 2016 to aid in the treatment of these conditions seen throughout the Institute. To learn more, visit Dent Institute Dot com. All right, and without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Laszlo Metchler. Good morning, Dr. Metchler. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. My pleasure. It's good to be here. Excellent. And first off, I want to thank you for joining us on the CanMed 24 Advisory Board for this year. We were very fortunate to have you as a presenter at CanMed 23, and folks can check out the video um, in our CanMed archive. I think I might be referencing it a few times throughout the conversation. Uh, We were fortunate to have you there and have Dent, the Dent Institute, as a sponsor for the medical practicum. I thought it was a great addition to the event, and we're excited to have you guys involved again for for next year in a bigger way. Yeah, it was a real pleasure being there and meeting uh, colleagues and uh, specialists in this field that was really eye-opening for me in many ways. So I really uh, 
honored and it's going to be a great pleasure to be there uh, for the next meeting. So thank you again for the invitation. Absolutely. And I'm excited to catch up with you today about all the the research and clinical studies that you and the team are doing at the Dent Institute, because it's substantial, um, I think. And it's important because those who are hesitant or maybe oppose some of the legitimacy of cannabis medicine will typically point to a lack of evidence. So it's vital that institutions like yours are, are doing the work, as they say. So that might be a good place to start. And uh, if you would kind of tell the audience a bit about the Dent Institute in, in your role there. So the Dent Institute was founded in 1960s. So before you ask, it wasn't founded by me because that would make me uh, too old. Okay. But I've been here close to 38 years. I'm the uh, chief medical officer or medical director of the Institute. We are the largest private neuroscience institute in the United States by far. Just to give you a feel, it, we see about 1,300 patients every day in the field of neurology. Uh, we're a private institute, uh, but we uh, work with uh, pharmacological or pharmaceutical companies. We have close to 100 studies looking at different uh, drugs in the field of neurology, uh, everything from Alzheimer's, MS, headache, uh, stroke, uh, movement disorders. Um, so we're very active in our research component, and the pharmaceutical world knows about us, seeing that we're the largest neuroscience institute. Uh, you know, I like to say that in today's world, research is done in academic centers, and people think that the private sector uh, doesn't do academic work. We're just the opposite. We're in the private sector, so we're a private institute run by physicians, but we do a tremendous amount of research. And the pharma world knows that. So that's one of the reasons uh, it was a little bit complicated when I got, got into uh, cannabis. And you used a word called uh, legitimate. Mm. So my whole thing is legitimacy. I, I'm a full professor at the university and the chief of, a, a, uh, of neuro-oncology at a, at a cancer hospital called Roswell Park. And the Den Institute is our private neurological institute where uh, in every year, we see over 310,000 patients, and uh, and uh, we uh, educate. In fact, in my in my room right now, I have uh, four or five students from all parts of the world listening. Uh, so we very uh, focused on research, education, and taking care of a lot of people with high quality care. That's what we're about. Excellent. Now. When did the Dent Institute get involved in cannabis? And was that sort of a logical fit for you guys? Illogical. It was not hmm. logical in any way, shape, or form. Um, only reason we got into it, because we take care of so many people. So when cannabis was was made legal in New York State uh, about six, seven years ago, um, we were getting phone calls, 500 a day. I said no. I have no idea about cannabis. I've, you know, uh, I'm not a smoker. I'm not a user. I'm not. A, I don't even use alcohol, which makes me tremendously boring. So the the point is, the next day it was another 500 phone calls. The third day, another 500 phone calls. Now, if you run a business, you can imagine how much money and energy that takes to answer those phone calls. So I had said, look, let's get into cannabis. Let's make a clinic. Let's start learning about it. So. Because we're you we're um, our business model is so private and not institutional, we're able to set up a cannabis clinic, and for the next six seven years, it, it took that amount of time to understand the use of cannabis in patients with neurological symptoms, including pain. And it, we're um, you know you're self taught. I mean, where are you going to go? Medical school? They don't teach it there. Right. Where uh, so so the only good places to learn is at these conferences. And so I was honored to be, you know, at these conferences everywhere from Tel Aviv to uh, Malta, Europe, and the United States. So I've been part of this and I've been learning as we go. And now I feel I have an expertise because how do physicians understand medicine? They have to see patients. So right now in the clinic, we have over 13,000 patients on cannabis for medical reasons. So I don't deal with recreational, and I need to emphasize that I'm purely on the medical side. I'm purely there to legitimize this whole process. Excellent. So 
was there a was there a light bulb moment or was there a specific um piece of evidence that you saw that you know kind of clicked in your head that you know there's something to this cannabis well as you're seeing patients as they come up to you and then throw their arms around you and hug you that's the changing moment hmm. that you found something where patients said you changed my life you got me off opioids my quality of life is improved and with tears in their eyes, they're hugging you and saying, thank you. That's the moment that every physician wants in their life. And I got that in cannabis, interesting enough. Uh, you know, I deal with bad diseases. I deal with, uh, you know, brain cancer. It's one of my specialties. And it's, it's, you know, you never get that moment. So, yeah, it changed the way I practice. Uh, I still do, you know, brain tumor research and treatment. I do uh, other things in neurology. But cannabis has been an eye-opening moment where you can change the quality of life of individuals by understanding how cannabis works on human beings. Great. And so now, how do the studies work at the Dent Institute? How do patients become enrolled and how, how does that process sort of start? So I, I don't have to teach the audience how difficult it is to do research in cannabis. Right. So in the same time, I you know we have every pharmaceutical company come in here. We do phase one, phase two, phase three studies. I have a whole research team uh, uh, looking and putting patients on board for you know, these drugs that we are using, for example, in migraines. Uh, so cannabis is a whole different story. Where do you get the support? Who pays for that research? Right. What company? So it, I realized very fast, if I want to do research in cannabis, it has to be self-funded init initially. We have to do our own research. So uh, th that perspective of being federal legal, being a Schedule One drug, made it very difficult to do prospective research. So I'm, I'm sitting and I say, well, let's get a um, Schedule One license. Then I realized back then, if I do get a Schedule One license, who could um, who can tell me that the cannabis that I'm using is of high quality, uh, which is, as we all know, initially it came from Mississippi. So so uh, I decided initially not to get the Schedule One license. I decided to uh, uh, do the following. Uh, I said the initial studies in the literature were small studies, 25 patients, 30 patients. And the criticism from the medical community that these are small studies and studies that uh, are not academically worthwhile. So I said, well, that's interesting. Um, uh, how about if we do retrospective large population studies? And that may open up the eyes for clinicians and academic physicians in that okay, we're not talking about 25 patients. We're talking about hundreds of patients and look at them retrospectively. So this, so it's popul population-based research, but larger numbers than what we've had in the past. And so I've had the opportunity to do that in multiple uh, subspecialties of neurology, everything from MS, Parkinson's, headaches, for example, uh, and dementia. Uh, we are looking also at other diseases like autism, uh, peripheral neuropathy, trigeminal neuralgia. So I'm going down the list of neurological disorders and getting large populations and looking at uh, efficacy and side effect profile, which is very important, ratios and dosage of what I'm using. And uh, I put that all in a data bank that I have of now, you know, 13,000 patients. So, so it's been very interesting to do, do this type of research. And as you know, hopefully if this becomes a schedule three drug, maybe things will change for clinicians like myself. Yeah, no, I de and I definitely want to to touch on that. But before we do, so when you say retrospectively, so is that you're putting patients on, uh, you know, uh, a, a course of cannabis medicine and then sort of checking in with them after a defined period of time and saying, you know, how has it helped you? Yes, yeah, exactly. So how do you treat somebody? So I'm, I'm looking at patients are not going to get, do not want to get high. The 75-year-old yep. female with rheumatoid arthritis, who doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, doesn't do uh, marijuana, uh, does not want to get high. This is where I have a problem with the cannabis world because a lot of uh, uh, people think, oh, all patients just want to get high. That's not true. Yeah. I look at a different population. These patients want to be uh, cautious. They do not want to get high with their grandchildren. Uh, 
uh, they want to be cognitively sharp, but they want pain relief. They want symptom relief. Uh, so, so as I'm seeing these patients, I'm realizing which ratios may work in which age group. Uh, and I have to be also very knowledgeable about what medications they're taking. I mean, many of these patients yeah. who are 75 years old, they're on 15 different drugs. So you just, and they may have asthma. So you don't want to give them a vape if they have asthma and on anticoagulation. So there's things you need to know. So that's why I think it's important that in medical cannabis programs, you have a physician or a physician extender who is very knowledgeable in how to use these medications, treat these patients. Uh, because, uh, uh, and then very important, come back in a relatively short period of time so you can adjust the dosage. You can adjust the titration schedule. You can adjust the ratio depending on the side effects and symptoms and efficacy rates. So you have to keep an eye on these patients. You know, in, in medical marijuana programs, a lot of people are seeing that. I'll see you back in one year. Hmm. I mean, the patients don't want that. They want to be nurtured through, their, through this experience and see somebody who's knowledgeable, and then they can see and follow up regularly. And when they get stable, then you can see them later in six months or 12 months. Right. And so where do you source the medicine? Are you just sort of giving recommendations and then they have to go to the dispensary and sort of yeah. get the medicine themselves? Yeah. In New York State, it's strict rules. So if as a physician, I can't be involved in the business of cannabis. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a dispensary here for medical marijuana. Um, you know, there are CBD products that I got involved with because that's a whole different world. Uh, you know, CBD products less than 0.3% THC. But in medical marijuana, uh, we're an institute. So we, we didn't have a dispensary in the institute. In my area, we have three of them. And the good news is that after some initial hurdles, initial difficulties, uh, they realized that whatever I want, I want my patients to get that. They can't change it at the dispensary. An example would be initially a patient went there. Uh, I gave a tincture. Uh, it was switched to a vape. The patient ended up in the emergency room because the, the, the butt tender or the, whoever worked at the dispensary did not know that the patient had asthma. And so these are just one example, but I work very well with the dispensaries. They, they respect my knowledge and, 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 and they understand that I'm adamant if I uh, uh, certify somebody for a ratio or dosage, that's what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so you mentioned before that when the medical marijuana program came on, there was a ton of interest and you were getting a lot of phone calls. How has that interest changed uh, over the years? Is it is it more than ever now? So, yeah, New York State's a big state, right? We have over 20 million people. And in the New York State program, I myself see 10% of all patients in New York State. And we, we let's include, you know, New York City, Long Island, and so on. So we see a lot of patients, uh, most of them in regionally, some are long distance, but they have to be within New York State. They can't come from Florida because you need a New York State license. Uh, so so uh, the program is a little bit rigid. It's very expensive. But the rigidity of the program, meaning everything has to be tested, has helped me because I know what my patients are getting. Uh it's important for me to understand because when you buy things off the street, you have no idea. And you know the literature has shown that cannabis off the street has a high incidence of contaminants. Everything from heavy metals, everything from bacteria, fungus, uh, pesticides, insecticides. So it's good to know my patients are getting something that is uh, tested often. Hence, the expense is higher which is an issue in most medical marijuana programs. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question. I went on a monologue, which I do some sometimes. But, uh, you know, the good thing about the uh, program is that I like the fact that it's strict. Um, but, oh, you, I, thank you. You asked a question about drop-off. Uh, so, as you know, New York State went from medical. Now it's recreational. Uh, has there been a drop-off? Uh, I would say yes. Hmm. Uh, I think people feel there's a it's complicated because in New York State we have a lot of reservations in Western New York, 
Mm -hmm. And on the reservation, being sovereign land, they actually have their own cannabis and sell it. Unfortunately, uh, what I've seen is that what they're getting is not always what was uh, advertised. Uh, and it's a lot of contaminants. And some of those contaminants, I've had positive LSD with wow. people on cannabis who have side effects and hallucinatory and paranoid reactions. So it is changing. I, I've asked New York State to protect the medical marijuana program. But as you may know, uh, Ben, when recreational marijuana comes into a state yeah. usually it affects the medical marijuana program so i think my numbers are down but let's be fair now i'm seeing patients who really really are interested in medical marijuana and don't want it for recreational reasons right yeah and do you think it's a case that some people think that they can sort of self-medicate you know just go through the the recreational program rather than kind of get a physician involved yeah, I think that's true. I think the younger patients think that. Yeah. I think the younger you are, the more likely that you don't you don't go to a doctor. But you know, we have a very strong um, uh, presence as an institute and as a physician. I've been in this community for over thirty five years, and so they kind of know your reputation as a cannabis doctor. And, and so, so I think a lot of patients uh, come to me uh, and are. Uh, comfortable with the knowledge set. I will also say one thing that I'm very different than anybody else. So when I started the program, I said, I'm not, I'm going to legitimize this. And I said, well, how do I legitimize a program where people are making a business out of it? Let's be fair. A lot of doctors got involved mm. for the sake of seeing a lot of patients in a short period of time and billing them $250 cash, yep. sometimes $350 not including a urine test, which is another additional money. Some people were paying $800 on an office visit. So I said, what if I don't accept their cash? And then, that's unheard of. What do you mean you don't accept people's cash? Who doesn't accept cash? Well, if you accept cash, that to me is, is not a legitimate process in medicine. So I said, I'm not going to accept any cash from any patient who comes to me for cannabis. So I talked to the CEOs of, of insurance companies health insurance companies. Uh, you know, I talked to them. I said, look, I'm going to see your patient, but I want to be the patient's doctor, not just giving him certifying for cannabis because they got back pain. So I became the treating physician, which mm -hmm. means that I, I dictated a three-page note. It, for example, you have, if they had multiple sclerosis and they have not had an MRI in 10 years, then maybe I'll do an MRI. Or if they have back pain, I like to know why they have back pain. So I wanted to go to the etiology of the symptom. Um, if they had trigeminal neuralgia, which is pain in the face, uh, I like to know what medications you're on. Maybe I can adjust it. So I wanted to become the treating physician. For that reason, I built the insurance company. And mm -hmm. all of them said yes. And I've not had a problem in six years. So when a patient comes to me, they'll have to pay cash at the dispensary, but they don't pay cash with me. I'll accept whatever their insurance pays. And I think you may understand a lot of these individuals don't have good insurance because they've been disabled. They're not working because of low back pain or chronic pain. So a lot of what the insurance pays is not a lot, but it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. I serve 13,000 patients. I think we have a very strong reputation. And to me, this is legitimizing the whole process. Yeah, I would say so. It's let me just amplify. It's if somebody accepts cash as a physician, I'm not critical of that. Uh, mm. If they do a good job and not just certify the patient and say goodbye, if they yeah. really keep an eye on them, then yeah, I don't have a problem with somebody accepting cash. But at my institute, uh, I said no to that. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think there definitely was a cottage industry that that popped up of just you know writing writing recommendations and being done with it. So, yeah, I know of people flying in from a different state and going to a strip mall, renting a, a office for one day and flying back the same day. I yeah, mean, that's I've heard not... stories, too, of, of doctors setting up booths at conferences and, you know, you just you just walk up and they'll write the recommendation for you and just keep keep the line moving. Well, and that initially, I'm not sure if it's still being done. Initially, then these 1 800 numbers, these phone numbers that you don't even have to see the doctor. All yeah. you have to do is call a phone number, get certified. Now, 
I don't I, I don't understand that that's such a money money focused way to take care of human beings. Um, you know, I, I really feel strongly that, and maybe that's because I, I, I you know, I'm a professor of neurology and oncology at a, a cancer hospital and here at the Institute, that I really think that if we take care of people, uh, we should do it in an ethical way with empathy. Uh, I don't mind if there's money at the tail end of this for physicians or institutes, but I think we can't lose the fact that patients want to be taken care of. Uh, again, in medical marijuana programs, not recreational. So I, I don't believe in calling a number and getting certified and then see you one year and, I, and, I'll, and I'll accept $250 from you. To me, that's not taking care of human beings. That's mm. a business. Yeah. No, and I think part of the problem, too, is, is something that you touched on earlier, is that most medical professionals are not educated on cannabis. So, you know, a lot of these patients who who want access to cannabis can't really go to their primary care doctor and have a, an intelligent conversation about it because you know they're just not they're not yeah. educated and you know i was one of those six seven years ago i i'll admit i'm the first one to admit that this is a process this is a road that i had to go down and understand and go to conferences and read books and uh, and and it really has opened up my eyes and understanding why we're in the situation we are today, because then it comes the politics of cannabis, mm. the social impact on cannabis, and and uh, you know the and and to understand where why we are here today, you need to go back historically, understand the history of cannabis, not the one about two thousand years ago or a thousand years ago, or O'Shaughnessy in Calcutta, India. Uh, in the 19th century, I'm talking about the 20th century history and how we are here today. Everything from uh, from uh, Nixon and the, why we are in the situation we are today. You need to understand that. And then you get a bit of comfort with cannabis. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's transition to some of the research that, that uh, your team is doing. I know that um, you might have some newly published research uh, into a couple of different conditions. Yeah, so, so so there's two types of research. One is the retrospective re retrospective large population studies in specific neurological disorders. I think what we published recently was the migraine uh, mm -hmm. uh, discussion, uh, chronic migraines and headaches, which is really I think very impactful uh, in that treatment of that population. We have done a lot of uh, recent pharmacokinetic studies, interesting, uh, looking at CBD products and how. Uh, what the pharmacokinetics are of different CBD products uh, in healthy individuals. So that, that's what I would yeah. call pharmacokinetic studies. Um, and, and we've done several of those recently. Um, what has recently been published is two publications. I think one has been accepted. I think the other one has just been accepted. One is multiple sclerosis. Well, without, you know, educating people on MS, we have one of the highest MS populations in the United States, if not the world, in Western New York. Huh. So MS is, you know, we have thousands of MS patients. So we see, it, we saw a population of MS. So we did publish an article of multiple sclerosis and use of cannabis, which is relatively interesting because, uh, 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 quoting from the results, that about 72% of patients' pain was alleviated or improved statistically significantly. Then they have spasticity that improved, and the opioid use was decreased by a significant amount of patients, either completely or partially, but just statistically different. So we have that article, and I have a very strong uh, neuropharmacological division of the DENT run by excellent uh, uh, PharmD uh, doctors, such as Dr. Renka. Dr. Aladine, and really, uh, we're very fortunate to have that team work with us hand in hand. The other article that we recently published is medical treatment of Parkinson's disease, which we all see Parkinson's disease. In that group, 56% of patients either stopped their opioids or decreased it significantly. In that case, we saw about 69 patients, about 87% of patients said their quality of life has improved on cannabis. Now I can quote, so that that article is called Medical Cannabis in the Treatment of Parkinson's Disease. The lead author is uh, is Tracy Abedin, who is our uh, one of our uh, farm 
uh, pharmaceutical doctors. Uh, and um, and that's an interesting article to read. So here we have retrospective looking at studies, looking at quality of life, side effect profile. For example, in the MS study, the main side effect was fatigue, 11%. Now, let me tell you, one of the main symptoms of MS is right. fatigue. Right. So it's hard to say that the 11% side effect was actually from the drug or not, because as I mentioned, it's a common side effect. So, so these are out of the literature. Uh, we have a lot of abstracts we present at the American Academy of Neurology. In fact, uh, for the first time ever, I ran a course uh, on cannabis, and I'm proud to say not 100 people showed up, several hundred people showed up for the symposium at the American Academy of Neurology, which is probably one of the more conservative mm. uh, medical societies in the United States. I always say that in the business of cannabis, you don't have to win over patients. You've won them over. You don't have to win over most of the politicians because most of the politicians, you won them over. It's the medical society you have to win over. You won the doctors over. The doctors individually mm. believe in it, most of them. But the medical societies that control the behavior of doctors, you haven't won them over, have you? Mm. You go to their websites and they say, yeah, we think there may be something there, but we don't want you to use it. We should. We want more research. That's what you hear across the board. Yep. So how do you win the medical societies over? Well, I ran a symposium uh, at the American Academy of Neurology, which is re very well received. I often will lecture there and give uh, abstracts, uh, even at the American Headache Society or other so neurological societies. So uh, and I go to Europe quite often to lecture at the European societies, which was surprisingly is probably a little bit more rigid than the American societies in many ways. So you asked me what ongoing studies. Well, we're looking at ALS. ALS, most people know the term Lou Gehrig's disease. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at a retrospective study. I can tell you some preliminary findings. So far, we see about 79 percent improvement in quality of life. Uh, then we looked at dementia, which is you know, huge. Why? We're an aging population. Dementia is going to be a major issue for us. As, the, as our lifespan increases, as we get older, uh, it's a major issue. Uh, so we looked at dementia. We saw a 65% improvement in quality of life. I'm not going to get into the specifics because it hasn't been published, but we're very op uh, op uh, uh, optimistic about that study. We have a study looking at epilepsy. We mm -hmm. know that a CBD product, Epidiolox, has been approved by the FDA via GW Pharmaceuticals uh, for the treatment of uh, uh, lennox gallstadt and Dravase and even tuberous sclerosis. So these are three rare types of seizures, and Epidiolox has been approved. Uh, we looked at our population. We added cannabis. We saw a 70%, 71% reduction in seizure control. Again, Retrospective, not perspective, not something that would be accepted as a FDA-approved uh, right. drug. <clears throat> we also looked at anxiety and insomnia. Uh, we saw a 50% reduction in insomnia and 45% reduction in anxiety. And we also looking at autism with one of my colleagues, Dr. McVig, who is a pediatric neurologist. So we, yeah, we're very much interested in putting the research in. Uh, that's what we're doing now. Uh, and 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 educating physicians, educating the population, educating the business world. Yeah, and now you and you mentioned that sort of the the medical associations are the the ones you need to win over. How, how is that fight going? <laughs> um, it's like fighting Mike Tyson. Yeah, um, I'm not doing well. Um, you know, I always say that if you can't change him from the outside, change him from the inside, right? Mm -hmm. Join him. I did. And I. it's very difficult because A, they always back off and say, where is the research? Where is the perspective randomized research? Mm -hmm. And we don't have it. Is it our fault that it's a schedule one drug and it's FDA illegal? No, it isn't. So I understand academically what they say, but there's a lot of drugs we use. And if you look at them, these old drugs, there weren't randomized studies, and we still use them. But 
understanding and being respectful for their coming from, yes, we have to do the randomized studies. Yes, uh, uh, the cannabis doctors have to be legitimate. They have to come with, uh, with uh, some legitimacy in their credentials and understand that you're fighting an uphill battle that you will win one day. Uh, we, you know, this is going to be one, and maybe descheduling it to schedule three is the first step to do randomized studies. Then you can change the perspective of the academic medical societies in this country, uh, around the world, not just the United States. But the United States, when it takes a lead on anything, then most of the other countries will step up and uh, and uh, and uh, continue and uh, continue what the American results are. So I'm hopefully getting the studies done here. Um, I'm looking for sponsors, which is very difficult. Who's going to sponsor my study? Mm -hmm. uh, cannabis business is not hot anymore. You know, the, the stocks yeah. are down. The, there's a shortage of money. Uh, and who's going to throw millions of dollars, but it's not thousands, millions of dollars for a randomized study looking at uh, uh, placebo versus different ratios of cannabis and migraine, for example. Beautiful study. It's going to work. But who's going to sponsor that? Will the government sponsor that? I can't get federal money on a federal legally company. I can't get it from the NIH. Uh, it has to be done state within the state, and it has to be done by a company that will support that. Uh, you know, in many ways, we should uh, join forces. Everybody who works with cannabis, every business puts in a, into a uh, a bank, and from that bank have a committee looking at good scientific research and then yeah. sponsoring it from that uh, uh bank and then then the physician groups can then publish these things prospectively i think that's a possibility in the future something we can talk about at our meetings yeah no and because I, I was going to bring that up that you know these cannabis companies they're not going to fund the research partially because they're not going to have a, like a proprietary drug either right i mean it's it's a natural medicine so if you publish that research, then you're actually in kind of emboldening your competitors as well and not just you. That's right. So you have to look at the big picture and you can't look at your own interests, which is very difficult today because uh, because the fact that companies are not doing well and they're looking at the bottom line. So, so to support research, that's going to be, if it's positive, if it's good, it's going to be good for everybody. So you got to look at the big picture uh, yeah. and hopefully one day we'll see that. So you mentioned rescheduling, and I think that's something that we're all sort of watching and hopeful for that there, we'll see some movement there. But so say um, it does get rescheduled. I think what schedule three is one of, is what's on the table here. How would things change for you if, if that were to happen? Well, it's going to change a lot of things. Um, so schedule three is like ketamine. Um, I, mean, I think Tana and Cody number three is in schedule three also so first of all it's still going to be federally legal illegal but locally i could do a prospective study looking at cannabis in the treatment of i'm going to give you an example i do have a protocol which i wrote for this for chronic migraine migraines defined by more than 15 headaches a month uh and i can look at a uh, placebo or a 20 to 1, 1 to 1 ratio, uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 milligrams. That's a prospective study. There'll be several arms. I could do that. You can ask me who's going to fund that. I'm going to say right now, nobody. Who's going to fund it? We're going to fund it. Uh, I have a benevolent um, uh, uh, family, Dent family. Dent was a, uh, a philanthropist back in the 60s who, by the way, had Parkinson's disease, started the Institute in 1963. And, and there is a family, non-for-profit family foundation that supports research within the Institute. And they, by the way, for the last six, seven years, have unequivocally supported my research mm. in cannabis. And that, and, that's, and that has given me the opportunity to publish, to put us on the map. And they still support, but we're not talking about millions. We're talking about significant amount, but they do support us. So, yeah, I'm going to get some seed money from them to support a study if I can do that, if it becomes a Schedule Three drug. And then I can publish that article prospectively, randomized study, 
part of the money from seed money from the Dent Family Foundation, part of the money through the Dent Cannabis Clinic will, you know, we'll readjust money to put it in research. Uh, so instead of putting it in our pockets, we'll put it in research, self-funded, if you want to use the term. Mm. And then we can publish that. Once we publish that, I could show it to the insurance companies. I can show it to the medical societies and, and then let them critique it. And, you know, one of the things is one of the problems I think you may understand is cannabis, medical marijuana or medical cannabis programs are too expensive for patients. Yeah. Now, I did it a way about I did a, a way. You don't have to pay me cash. That's a positive for the patient. Right. right. But they have to pay in cash. And some of these patients are paying eight hundred dollars a month. They can't afford it. And let me be honest with you. In the medical marijuana program, most of the people can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And because they can't afford it, and the insurance companies throw their arms up and say, you know, we're sympathetic. We know that if you put somebody on medical marijuana, they'll tell, take less opioids, they'll take less Xanax, they'll take less sleeping pills, they'll take less uh, anti-inflammatories. So it's good for the insurance companies, but they fall back on the fact, no research. So if I have a prospective study, the first thing I'm going to do is present it to every CEO of every insurance company because let's pay for this because, A, I save you money. I keep patients out of emergency rooms. They have less testing because their quality of life have improved and they're lose, using less drug. So that's the first thing I'll do. So that may change something uh, at that level. Then the medical societies will look at it, critique it. Uh, it'll be published in... Uh, in peer-reviewed journals, which is very important. Mm -hmm. And maybe we start moving at the medical society level. Uh, so uh, I'm optimistic that for me, it's going to be fine. It's going to be a step in the right direction. I'm not sure if it's going to help the business of cannabis <laughs> because it's still federally legal. There's still taxation issues, um, um, banking issues, as you all know. And yeah. I'm, yeah, I don't get involved in that. I just read what I read. So, but in my perspective, I think it's a positive move. Yeah. So will insurance companies, they will, well, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, but be, it being a schedule three drug would not, you know, preclude them from, from covering it. It could be a schedule three drug, but it'll, but anything you use it for, it's off label because mm -hmm. it's off label because it's not, not been approved in that disease. For example, uh, what disease? Say migraine. That makes it easy. Yes. Yeah. 36 million migraineurs in this country, 36 or 700,000 patients in the United States with MS. Yeah. That's a lot of patients. Will they approve it? They won't because show me the research. Right, right, right. How can I prove a drug off label that there's no science that shows it works? Then you go testimonials. Well, I have patients who can't live without it. That doesn't count. It doesn't. Testimonials don't count. Randomized phase two, phase three studies do count. Yeah. So that's what we'll have to do. And we'll do it. Yeah. And then would it come down to that they would approve a certain uh, formulation or a certain product? Or could it be as, as broad as cannabis? So so that's that's a, that's another problem. You yeah. <laughs> Ben, you open up a can of worms because that's the criticism of a plant. It's, you can't patent it, and it what that we what we're dealing with is never sativa or indica. They're all hybrids, right? Yeah. <laughs> and when you do a study, how rigid and strict is the use of cannabis, and what are you using actually? Well, that's one of the advantages in New York State because our patients know exactly what's in it. Mm -hmm. I know what's in it. I know what the ratio is. So I'm so you can't do it with recreational. It has to be uh, regulated cannabis coming from probably one facility that's tested regularly each batch and look at that. It won't be easy. It won't be easy, mm. but it's as you, uh, but it'll be a step in the right direction. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think we're all we're all hopeful that that's um, that's what's going to happen, but um, remains to be seen. Um, and, and sure. Go ahead. No, I was saying one of the problems is that a lot of smart doctors, a lot of smart researchers are working at the best places in the country. 
academic centers that are FDA funded by research. So they have a fear of doing cannabis research by having their other research being pulled. So look, there's a lot smarter people around the country at Duke, at Johns Hopkins, at Mass General, who I know personally, uh, who could do the research. Uh, but it, you know, one of my advantages is that that institute that's behind me is a private institute. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a CEO of a hospital. I don't have a dean of a university saying yes or no. If we think it could work, we'll do it in, uh, in a legitimate process. But we can do the research. Uh, and But in the United States, most of the high quality research is done at academic centers that unfortunately, sometimes they're 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 unable to do it because of uh, fear and political reasons. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, Dr. Mitchell, I definitely want to be mindful of your time um, and you're, you're kind enough to come on here. Um, but before I let you go, I want to give you an opportunity to share with the audience any additional resources or research. I know that you, you mentioned some studies, some papers, and I'll definitely put those links in the show description so people can uh, read more and learn more. So if there's other resources sort of like that that I could include, uh, please let me know. And also, um, any other other plugs for the Dent Institute and yourself, um, now is the time. Yeah, we're very happy to see all patients for all neurological disorders, including cannabis. You have a lot of good people in this country doing excellent research. Uh, I always quote Ethan Russo. I think he has done extremely work. I recently uh, had Dustin Surlek come into my office. Oh, great. And he, he, get, he was kind enough to give me his book, which I've been reading, which I think is excellent reading. So if you like to read Dustin Surlek's book, I think it's on cannabis. It is really a, a phenomenal book. And he's called The Healer, and I understand why meeting him. So we have a lot of good people in this field. I think what you need to do is, is just bring them together, uh, uh, brainstorm what's our next steps at that level. Uh, uh, so so I will continue my you know uh, large population retrospective studies. I think uh, I have 800 patients on cannabis who have a neuropathy and people in the audience, many of them have neuropathies. So I think that's a very interesting study I'm putting together. Um, I like to see the results of that, but my preliminary results are quite positive. Uh, so yeah, we, so uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, good books out there. Uh, come to these meetings. I think these meetings are phenomenal. Talk to individuals. Uh, I just want the business of cannabis to support the science of cannabis. Mm. Because if we uh, have a schism, if we depart from each other, then it will never be accepted in the medical community. And that's what we have to do. We have to accept it at medical schools where they teach it to the medical students. We have to look at residency programs where patients are able to bring their cannabis into the hospital and not told you can't bring it in. We have to look at it at the attending level and at the university levels also. So mm -hmm. we have to win them over, but it's it'll take time, but it's mm -hmm. going to happen. Right. It's going to happen because once you're in the cannabis, you realize the results uh, and and it's not a panacea, meaning it's not doesn't cure everything. And we have to watch out. Because as soon as you yeah. tell a doctor that I'm going to treat your cancer with only medical marijuana, their eyes will roll and they think you're a nutcase. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to watch out for. You can say that there's scientific proof that in in uh, tissue uh, uh, examples and in animal models that cannabis has decreased the size of tumors, but you can't take it to the next level where that's the treatment. Because I see patients come in my office who have breast cancer, which is a treatable disease of today, who said, no, I don't want radiation. I don't want chemo. I just, just give me cannabis. I won't treat those patients. Mm -hmm. I'll give them cannabis because it improves their quality of life, but they have to go through mainstream treatment. So we have to be very cautious <clears throat> and we have to emphasize to our colleagues that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's great. You mentioned Ethan and, and Dustin Sulak, who are fellow advisory board members uh, with yourself oh, I, that's good to know. for CAMED 24, and they will be participating in the medical practicum again uh, for CAMED 24. So if there's any physicians out there that want to get a, a world-class education on cannabis medicine, that's the place to be. I agree, Ben. 
All right. Dr. Metchler, thank you again for the time and can't wait to see you down in Florida. I'm looking forward to it. Not that Buffalo has bad weather, but <laughs> Buffalo has bad weather. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good talk to you, Ben. All right. We'll see you soon. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Metzler. Check out the links in the show description to learn more about the topics we discussed. And thanks again to this episode's sponsor, the Dent Institute. Our next episode drops November 29th. That's two weeks from today. In the meantime, please go to CanMedEvents.com now to register for our CanMed 24 Innovation and Investment Summit. You can claim your ticket now at the early bird rate but the deadline is December 1st. You can also submit your abstract for consideration for oral and poster presentations at the summit right now. The deadline for that is November 18th. Go to canmedevents.com to learn more about the process and good luck. Also, I invite you to follow us on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Just search for CanMed Events. And lastly, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you use to listen to or watch us. All right, that's it from us. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and be sure to join us for the next CanMed Coffee Talk.